Good evening. First, I want to thank M. Lewis and the Rockland Public Library staff for inviting me here tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I'm not sure if you really realize where we are, but we are in the midst of what has had been probably the second largest black community in the state of Maine. But I guess I should start at the beginning. When those from really far away first found our shores, you had only three ways of moving about. You went by boat, by horse, or by foot. And with such a wonderful sheltered harbor, no wonder European sailors found Rockland to be the perfect spot. It, boy, this thing's just been moving and moving, hasn't it? <laughs> okay. Samuel Waldo, when Samuel Waldo settled in here, he called it the Shore Village. They harvested lumber, farmed, and fished. Eventually, they discovered a deep deposit of pure limestone that led to creating a lime industry, which took off in earnest after the Revolutionary War. In 1848, the town of East Thomaston separated from Thomaston, and two years later changed its name to Rockland. It became a city in 18. 54 and later the county seat. Warren and Thomaston and South Thomaston also became their own communities after the Civil War. There was another community that I haven't mentioned. I will knit now. <coughs> Amos Peters was a black man who had been born in 1737 as a slave. He fought against the British in the Revolutionary War and had part of his ear shot off during the conflict. According to one story, because of his service, Amos Peters gained his freedom and moved from Plymouth, Massachusetts to this area where he worked for General Henry Knox, the son-in-law of Samuel Waldo. Apparently, General Knox was hiring anyone who had served in the Revolutionary Army. When Amos Peters married a woman named Sarah, General Knox gave them some land and what became Warren. Their property, however, became known as Petersboro, although technically it was still part of Warren. Amos's wife, Sarah, came to Maine as a slave of a Captain Brown of Damascata. In 1783, he sold her to a Captain McIntyre who took her to Walderboro. The next year, Sarah heard about Quack Walker. In a, in a 1783 landmark decision, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled in Quack Walker's favor, saying that all men are born free and equal. So since the District of Maine was part of Massachusetts, Sarah basically filed a lawsuit and was declared a free person. No wonder the descendants of Amos and Sarah Peters were ready to fight for freedom and to die. In the Civil War, among the Company B of the 43rd Pennsylvania Colored Troops, were Daniel Webster Peters, Dexter Peters, James Peters, Reuben Peters, and William Peters, all from the Petersboro section of Warren, Maine. Daniel Webster Peters died in Philadelphia. James and Reuben Peters were brothers and a cousin to Daniel Webster. James, who was married, died in the service of his country on January 6, 1864. His brother Reuben was killed in action two months later in the Battle of Petersburg, Virginia. Another Peters from Warren, Emerson, served as a private in Troop B of the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry 
Cullet Regiment. He enlisted in September 1864 and was mustered out the following May. A cousin of the Peters men, Francis Olney of Warren, also served in Company C of the 43rd Pennsylvania. Abram Peters and Merrill Peters were in the Union Navy during the war between the states. Another Peters from Warren served in the Navy during the Spanish-American War, while William E. Peters and Charles Edmund Peters fought in World War I. Sidney Peters, Sidney Carroll Peters served in Korea. Like Amos and Sarah, the Peters of Warren, Maine stood up tall when their country called. The picture of the Peters family, which I have posted, was taken in 1936 in Petersboro. The boy in the front is Sidney Carroll Peters, who later fought in Korea. A number of other black families moved to this area and many took up residence in Petersboro. If they were lucky, they married into the Peters family. Another story of how so many black folks wound up here is because of General Knox. The story goes that General Knox was stationed in Virginia during the Revolutionary War and fell in love with the beautiful mansions there. When he returned home, he wrote to friends in the South saying he needed some black folks to work for him in Maine. Apparently, many blacks came north and General Knox paid them for their service. According to this version, so many people were on Knox's estate that he sent some of them to live in the settlement started by Amos and Sarah Peters. And then there's the version that many blacks came to Rockland, Thomaston area, when ships from here were returning after delivering their cargo of lime to southern ports. Take your pick. Probably a little bit of all three stories are closer to the truth. But what is known is that Petersboro had perhaps the largest concentration of blacks in Maine outside of Portland. At least 100 blacks were counted in Warren at one time. Surprisingly, perhaps, it's not always easy to identify black folks from the record. Take a look at the family of Ezra and Clarissa Martin who were living in Rockland in 1850. Both parents are listed as white. No mark means white. Yet all four children are identified as mulatto. I did some further checking, and in the 1860 census, I found two of the Martin brothers, Augustus and Daniel, living in Rockland. Head of that family, uh, that household, is 45-year-old Arseneth Over, who also is listed as mulatto. The Over family, by the way, was prominent in Petersboro, and was related to the Peters family by marriage. Perhaps we Mainers just weren't paying attention when black folks walked into and out of our lives. Did you know that the black man, the first black man we know by name to have been in what is now Maine was here in 1608. That's 12 years before the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock and two and a half centuries before Rockland became a city. But Thou da Costa served as an interpreter for a group of French explorers that included Samuel de Champlain, the guy for whom the lake is named. Da Costa is believed to have been fluent in Dutch, English, French, Portuguese, Mi'kmaq, and Pigeon Basque, and is known to have been sought by both the English and the Dutch to help in their contacts with Aboriginal peoples in North America. And he wasn't the only one. A 1672 court document describes Anthony, a black man. Anthony was Dr. Antonio Slamey, 
and may have been Maine's first doctor. In a strange way, <laughs> blacks of Maine have been invisible. Now, how do you make people invisible? Especially people whose skin color should make them stand out. Well, the James Fa Avery family of Waterboro, Maine pulled off the magical act to perfection. The Averys were known for their many stone walls that they built in York County in the 1800s. The family also became known for their work on the Underground Railroad, housing escaped slaves. After all, who really noticed that there were five blacks building the wall yesterday, seven doing the job today, and only four tomorrow? It was perfect. You made someone invisible by letting everybody see them. Or not. <laughs> Throughout Maine's history, there have been, and still are, Black folks who are quite visible, even if you don't notice them. The books, Maine's Visible Black History, co-authored by two friends of mine, H.H. H. Price and Gerald Talbot, and published in 2006, remains the first and now one of only two state Black histories that have been published. The book shows that between 1820 and 1870, a period of only 50 years, Blacks were living in 274 towns in Maine, including Rockland, Thomaston, Warren, and several other Knox County communities. Now, Maine's Visible Black History is available in the library here, as well as other libraries in the area, and also at a number of the high, local high schools. But although they were here, Africans and their descendants have never been a big portion of Maine's population. So far, I've presented a pretty upbeat portrait of Maine and its people of African ancestry. I don't want you to leave thinking the state has been the perfect toast. Educator and author Patricia Walls has found nearly 500 enslaved people in the towns of Old Kittery and Berwick in colonial times. She published a study in her book, Lives of Consequence. The book is available at the Longfellow Bookstore in Portland, as well as at the Maine Historical Society's bookstore. There's Macon Allen, Macon Bowling Allen. He was the first African-American lawyer in the United States. He passed the bar exam in Portland in 1844. He later moved to Boston where he became the first black to become a justice of the peace. John Brown Rustworm was just the third black to graduate from college in the United States when in 1826, he gave the commencement speech at Bowdoin where his classmates included Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Rustworm later was the co-editor of a black newspaper before he immigrated to Liberia, where he became the first black governor of that African nation. A native of Cape Verde, Narcissus Medeus arrived in Bangor in 1834. At one time, he had seven wagons delivering baggage and express packages in Bangar, the FedEx or UPS of his day. He also owned and drove the first coach, a nine-seater bus owned by a private individual in the Queen City. He was a member of the Bangor Fire Department and the first man in Bangor to deliver ice to individual customers. One of his grandsons, Frederick Dick Mathias, was the first black to graduate from the University of Maine, Orono. Robert Benjamin Lewis was born in Pittston in 1802. He held three United States patents, including one machine to caulk the seams of wooden ships in order to make them watertight. The hair picker, as it was called, 
became a mainstay of main shipyards for years. Lewis also wrote the first world history book from a viewpoint of African Americans and Native Americans entitled Light and Truth. Bishop Jane, James Augustine Healy was the oldest of 10 children born to Irishman Michael Healy and his slave wife, Mary Eliza. James was valedictorian of the first graduating class at Holy Cross College in 1849. And in 1875, he became the first African-American Catholic Bishop in the United States when Pope Pius IX named him to that post in Portland. Under Healy's administration, membership in the Catholic Church in his jurisdiction of Maine and New Hampshire doubled to about 100,000. The bishop's brother, Patrick Healy, was president of Georgetown University. When he retired from that post, he moved to Portland to help his brother bring more Mainers into the flock. Another brother, Michael Healy, quit school and became a sailor. In 1880, he was commissioned a third lieutenant by President Lincoln and became the first African-American to command a U.S. government ship. During the last two decades of the 19th century, Captain Healy was essentially the federal government's law enforcement presence in the Alaska Territory. In 1999, a Coast Guard research icebreaker, the USS, the US Coast Guard Cutter Healy was named in his honor. And in 1903, their sister, Eliza Healy, became the first African-American mother superior at a Catholic convent and school in St. Albans, Vermont. Born in Portland, William Wilberforce Ruby became a district fire chief in Portland and is credited with giving the first alarm of the Great Portland Fire on July 4, 1866. For those who don't really know that much about that fire, it was the largest fire in the United States until Mrs. Murphy's cow kicked over the Latin in Chicago. If you believe that, I. I got a bridge in Brooklyn I'll sell. <laughs> uh, William Ruby is also credited with using wet blankets to keep the Abyssinian meeting house from burning in the fire. William's brother, George Thompson Ruby, graduated from the first class at Portland High School to have both boys and girls. He went on to become a foreign correspondent in Haiti a state senator in Texas during Reconstruction, and a newspaper editor and owner in New Orleans. A football standout at Portland High School, Tiger Ted Lowry became a New England boxing champion. Although he lost twice to Rocky Marciano, the Providence Journal wrote of their first meeting, Lowry won six of the 10 rounds, but Marciano won the fight. Much more recently, James Craig was chief of police in Portland. He left for the same job in Cincinnati and currently is chief of police in his native Detroit, Michigan. Emmanuel Koch left his job in Philadelphia to become superintendent of schools in Portland. He moved to Lexington, Kentucky, where he was superintendent of the Fayette County Public Schools uh, before his untimely death. Sheila Hill Christian came to Portland from Richmond, Virginia to take the job of assistant city manager. When her boss left, she was named acting city manager, but decided not to take that job on a permanent basis. She then became assistant city manager in Cincinnati, Ohio. A tax expert at the Portland law firm, Bernstein Schur, Willette Elder also served as a director of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southern Maine 
she moved on to a financial company in New York City. Danielle Conway was Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Southern Maine Law School until she was named Dean of Penn State's Dickinson Law School. She is considered a leading expert in public procurement law, entrepreneurship, and intellectual property law. Michael Greer was and is executive director of the Portland Ballet. I love that one. He came to Portland, Maine after spending several years in China where his wife and both of their children were born. After spending several years on the East Coast, Michael currently is director of the Portland, Oregon Ballet. <laughs> but it's not just long, long ago that people of color have contributed greatly to our state. Three internationally known artists have had roots in Maine. Daniel Minter lives in Portland. His work can be seen in the official logos of the Maine Freedom Trails, the Underground Railroad, and the Maine Interfaith Youth Alliance. Minter also has designed two Kwanzaa stamps for the United States Post Office and teaches illustration at the Maine College of Art. In 1962, Ashley Bryan became the first African-American to publish a children's book as an author and illustrator. Bryan now lives on Cranberry Isle. The late David Driscoll was a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. Driscoll first came to Maine in 1953 to attend the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He bought a home in Falmouth and split his time between Maine and Maryland before he died of the coronavirus. Among other posts Susan Rice held in the Obama administration, was U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. She is the daughter of Lois Dixon Rice, a native of Portland who helped persuade Congress to provide federal subsidies, known as Pell Grants, to tens of millions of college students. Barbara Nichols was born in Waterville and grew up in both Augusta and Portland. She became the first Black to be elected president of the American Nurses Association. And she is still the only non-white to hold that position. Barbara went on to head up a, an international company <clears throat> and is currently teaching nursing at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Joyce Gibson is the Dean of USM's Lewiston Auburn campus, the school's top official in the LA area. She is the recipient of the Mary Ann Hartman Award, which honors Maine men who have contributed to the quality of our lives by their work in arts, politics, business, education, healthcare, or community service. Craig Hickman of Winthrop served three terms in the Maine House and is now a state senator. Rachel Talbot Ross is a state representative from Portland, following in the footsteps of her father, Gerald Talbot, who was the first black elected to the Maine legislature. A ninth generation Mainer, Rachel serves the Democratic caucus as assistant house majority leader. Dr. Richard Evans is serving his first term in the Maine house where he is representing Dover Foxcroft. There were other Black folks who have impacted Maine and its history. William Burney served two four-year terms as mayor of Augusta. He also was inducted into the Maine Basketball Hall of Fame for his exploits while at Coney High School. 
Jill Dusen worked for almost 15 years for Central Maine Power and Northern Utilities in various management posts, positions before she entered politics. She was on the Portland City Council where she twice served as mayor of Maine's largest city. <clears throat> Born in Somalia, Deca Delac became a United States citizen in 1998. She received international publicity recently when she became the first African-American and the first Muslim to become mayor of South Portland. John Jacobs is my favorite politician. I mean, this guy is a native of, New of Newark, New Jersey. He came to Maine in 1970 to attend Bates College. After earning a degree in psychology, Jenkins traveled the world participating in martial arts competition. He won his first world championship in karate in Japan in 1977 and later won four more world championships in karate and one in jiu-jitsu. In 1993, Jenkins was elected mayor of Lewiston by a three to one margin. He then was elected as Maine's first black to serve in the state Senate. In 2008, he was elected mayor of Auburn. <laughs> he moved across the river. When Jenkins decided not to seek reelection, his name was not on the ballot but voters in Auburn elected Jenkins anyway, <laughs> with a write-in vote total that was more than all of those on the ballot combined. <laughs> he was only 68 years old when he died in September of 2020. Born in Portland, the late Beverly Dodge Bowens became a nurse and a hospital administrator. While at Portland High, she wanted to join the senior class trip to Washington, D.C., only to find Blacks were not allowed to stay in hotels in the nation's capital. With the help of Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith, Beverly broke that color barrier and joined her classmates at their hotel. Thomas, excuse me. Nineteen fifty-two. I know that because she graduated in fifty-two. I graduated the next year. In fact, I actually I took Beverly to her senior prom. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Douglas moved to Maine in two thousand four to practice law with a mid-sized firm in Portland. He now is a partner in his own law firm in Westbrook. Several years ago, he won a major case when the Maine Supreme Court ruled that national fraternities have a legal duty to prevent sexual misconduct by their members at chapter-sponsored events. Tom also plays guitar and bass and performs with several musical groups. Shea Stewart Bowley lives on Peaks Island and is executive director of Community Change, Inc., a faith-based nonprofit in Southern Maine. She also is a writer known for her blog titled Black Girl in Maine. Dr. Florence Edwards graduated from Portland High and attended the University of New England before going to dental school at Howard University in Washington, DC. After a stint in the US Army, Dr. Edwards returned to Portland, where she currently practices dentistry and serves on the board of Equality Maine. Then there are the newest African Americans who have arrived in Maine in more recent years. Pius Ali is the first African native to be elected to the Portland School Board and then to the Portland City Council. A native of Ghana, Ali is also founder and executive director of Maine Interfaith Youth Alliance, director and co-founder of the King Fellows, and has been involved in several other organizations, including Seeds of Peace. Although Angela Okafor earned a law degree in her native Nigeria 
and passed the bar exam in New York, she was unable to get a job in the legal field. So she washed dishes for a living. That was, excuse me, that was before she opened her own law practice, an international market, and a hair care business in Bangor. And yeah, she's now a member of the Bangor City Council. Then there's Lewison's Satya Khaled. When she was seven years old, Satya and her family fled the war in Somalia. At the age of 14, she became an American citizen. 10 years later, Sophia became the first Somali American and the youngest person ever to be elected to the Lewiston City Council. Her roots are firmly in Lewiston where she graduated from high school. Or as Sophia put it, quote, Lewiston is where I learned to write my name, end quote. A native of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Claude Raganji has been elected to the Westbrook City Council. Claude also is the founder and executive director of Prosperity Maine in Portland. Born in Haiti, Tanya Jean Jacques was raised in Montreal, Canada, and came to the United States to complete her college degree in nursing. After her husband, who is a cardiologist, found a job in Hampton, Tanya ran for and was elected to the Hampton School Board. A native of Darfur, Sudan, Eklis Ahmed resettled in Portland in 2005. Since then, she has graduated from high school with honors, earned her college degree in sociology. Besides teaching at Westbrook Middle School, she is vice president and co-founder of a nonprofit organization, Darfur Youth of Tomorrow. Adele Masingo Nioi had been a professor in her native Democratic Republic of the Congo. But when she arrived in Portland in 2000 as a refugee and single mother, Adele could not speak English and felt hopeless and lost. Now, she is a fashion designer, founder of the Adele Masingo Designs. She also founded Women United Around the World, an organization that promotes the leadership development of female immigrants, teaches sewing, and provides connections in the community for new immigrants. Because of discrimination, Americans never heard of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. That has changed dramatically since several movies have been made about the exploits of the all black outfit known as the Red Tails. Two Tuskegee Airmen had ties to Maine. Eugene Jackson was the only Maine native to serve with the Red Tails. He died at his Massachusetts home in 2015. Jim Shepard was the only Tuskegee Airman to live in Maine after the war. A native of New York City, Jim moved to Maine to head up the FAA office at the Portland International Jetport. He lived in Westbrook in South Portland before his death in 2018. Now, there's a great story I've got, I'm going to tell you about these two Tuskegee Airmen. Gene Jackson was speaking at the University of Southern Maine. His topic was growing up Black in Portland. Attending the talk was Jim Shepard. Afterwards, Shepard questioned Jackson about his wearing a Tuskegee Airmen cap. Jim said he knew all of the Tuskegee Airmen and he didn't know Jackson. Well, in their discussion, they realized they knew the same people. Two weeks later, Jim Shepard received a letter from Eugene Jackson that included this picture. It had been taken in Italy during a brief break from the fighting in World War II.
that's slow. <laughs> I type faster than that. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for your talk. It was still very upbeat. Thank you. Um, That's me. <laughs> I'm glad it's up but but I wouldn't mind hearing if you're willing some some not so upbeat episodes. Well, like I said, there was I know there have been slaves throughout Maine, um, and in some cases, for example, I found one woman who died in 1926 or 27 in Cape Elizabeth. And she was with this family. She was called a servant. And I going back, I kept finding her. Her name kept changing. Just her, her Con, Constancia Brune was her original name. And it was called Constance. And I heard, I saw one place, Roostance, where they had misspelled. I traced her all the way back to the 1860 census with the same family. She's nine years old, a servant. She never left their employ. Maybe she was happy. I don't know. So, I mean, I, I can't tell. Um, in 1820 census, there's a family of 10 in Bristol listed as slaves. 1830, they're listed as free blacks. Uh, and, and you find this, I mean, you know, sometimes what is the difference? I made mention that General Knox was known for paying the blacks that work for him. How much he paid them, we don't know. Um, I think the, as far as I'm, I can see, a difference might be the fact is, can you leave? And that we don't know. Yeah. Could Constance Brune, could she, oh, by the way, she was originally from Cuba. I don't know if I said that. Um, could she have gotten up and got a job next door or could she have found a guy and got married and left? Don't know. And it only is speculation on our part. Yeah. Maybe she was happy. Maybe she wasn't. And so that, uh, I mean, I can tell you what I have found for facts. I can't tell you what their conditions were. This area was well known, by the way, for blacks, for farming. A lot of black farmers in this area, but then there were a lot of farms here. That's the reason that the settlements, you had a great harbor, plus you had some fertile land for farming. That's the reason that these towns are here. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, they eventually moved away or died. The, the photo I showed was of the cemetery, which is still there. That's the photo of the south there. Um, but, the, you know, people ask me about why Blacks move. And they move for the same thing that everybody moves for, jobs. And so you find that Blacks came here in the beginning because Costa Maine was huge during the day of sale of wooden ships. Once they started, metal ships, iron ships, and using engines to propel them, Maine, all of Maine went, went away. But people don't realize how strong Maine was. There were 34 generals in the Civil War from the state of Maine. Two of them were Confederate generals. <laughs> there were more generals in the Confederate Army from Maine than from Texas. Texas had one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but at, during that period, 1860, 
Maine had eight electoral votes. We've got four now. That shows you how, how, how powerful we were. There's a reason that our model was to go, I lead. Or you've also heard, as Maine goes, so, so goes the nation. Because we were quite powerful at one point. We were not vacation land. People came here to work. <laughs> and once we didn't have the shipping anymore. Portland, by the way, was one day closer to Europe than Boston. Even today, Portland has more tonnage passed through the harbor than Boston does. People don't realize that. We're, at one point, we were the fourth largest oil port on the Atlantic seaboard. But once that left, the shipbuilding left, and the line business left, there's no place else. So people, blacks and whites, went to Boston for jobs, went to New York, for went someplace else for jobs, for work. Then comes, uh, after the Civil War, and General Knox here, General O.O. O. Howard in the Lewiston, Leeds area, same thing, a lot of, a lo and a lot of Maine soldiers, Remember, Maine had more soldiers fighting in the Civil War than any other Northern state, percentage-wise. When they came home, a lot of them brought Blacks with them. Why? I can't tell you. But a lot of them did. We know that General Knox wanted, you know, he saw Montpelier in Virginia, and he with all those blacks around, I guess that's what he wanted here. Um, but they came up, blacks came up right after the Civil War, a lot of them. Then after uh, jobs were no longer available, they left. And whites left. The same thing happened World War II, the shipyards, two shipyards in South Portland. And when I was growing up, I grew up during World War II, and there were a lot of Blacks around. As soon as the shipyard closed, there were no jobs. They moved away. And that's what I'm sure what happened in Petersburg. I mean, not everybody wants to be down on the farm. <laughs> and so, you know, you go other places, see other things, especially with the, the Peters, they traveled, you know, they were up and going. And eventually, in fact, in the, in the book, Maine's Visible Black History, I was reading it this afternoon about Petersboro. And they were, I, they were, the woman that wrote the article talks about how there were only there was only like one or two families left when she got interested in it. So uh, yes. Um and there were two descendants there in the audience. Oh. Got a big yeah. And, and I also wanted to ask you, you said there was another book on black history in me. No. Well, there's main visible black history. And yeah, the only other book about states, about blacks in a state is one on, I believe it's Arizona. And those are the only, you would think that, yeah, yeah, or close, you know, but no, those are the only, two. And, and Maine was by far the first. Negro islands close to shore along the main coast. Many places are named now, but on older maps. Um, he wants to know more about them and why they were named that. Everybody would like to know that. Uh, why islands were named Negro islands and some were named the N word. Um, Gerald Talbot, who was the first black to be elected to the state legislature and whose daughter. Rachel Talbot Ross is in there now. 
uh, got a law passed to get rid of those names as well as those like Squaw Mountain, what were considered uh, derogatory names for Native Americans. So, uh, but uh, there had to be a reason. In Camden, the story goes that one of the first ships that came in to the harbor had an African cook aboard who saw the island in the harbor and said, that's my island. And from then on, it was named Negro Island. That's the story that's in the Camden history books. Uh, it could be true. I don't know. Just, just repeating. And there were a lot of them like that, supposed to be. I know this that uh, Dorothy Simpson in the book, Maine Islands, one of the first books I read about Maine that I, got me interested. She talks about Monhegan Island and the various languages that are, had been, that if Monhegan Island could speak, it would speak in all of these various languages of fishermen that have stopped there. And one of them is Portuguese, which is quite interesting because I made mention of Cape Verde. Cape Verde is a, a tin island archipelago off the coast of Africa, off actually off the coast of Senegal. And in the 1400s, Portugal took it over and it made it, uh, one of the things about Portugal, and I'm diverting here, Portugal and France did something a little different. When they took over things, they made them part of their country. So the Cape Verde Islands actually were part of Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> when they had a king. I mean, there was no representation. Uh, but people that came from there were called Portuguese. And when I was growing up, all the people in New Gloucester and Bed New Bedford were called Portuguese. Now we're finding out they're Cape Verdeans. Uh, they were picked up on whaling ships. For those who don't know, you don't sail full because you have to feed everybody <laughs> and pay everybody. So you, when you leave port, you leave with the fewest people that you actually need just to sail. And then you make a stop at the Cape Verdes and pick up the rest of your crew, go whaling. When you come back home, a lot of those Cape Verdeans say, I don't wanna go out anymore. And so they stay on shore. And they were the ones that were real big in the cranberry harvest down in, in Massachusetts and the Cape and stuff. And they're still there. I mean, their descendants are still there. But these are the various uh, stories that you hear about the various Negro islands that, and they're all up and they were all up and down the coast. Almost every, almost every port had one <laughs> nearby. In fact, I think down around Biddeford, there were two called Negro Islands. Uh, that doesn't answer the question really, but I talk a lot. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about the black community in Bangor right now? Bangor. Uh, you said right now. It's strange. I don't know right now. It was a very vibrant community. What I found very interesting in my research, and I did the research simply because I was doing my genealogy and wondering why my family made this move or that move or where the various people that they married came from. And what I found very interesting is the Kennebec River is almost a dividing line. Uh, I believe, although it seems like it runs east-west, I believe it actually, Kennebec River runs north-south. <laughs> I'm thrown by that all the time. So west of the Kennebec, 
most people, most blacks come from or have roots south of here. Uh, and that could be the Caribbean, it could be the South, could be Maryland, it could be New York or Massachusetts. Connecticut was a lot, a lot of people came up. East of the Kennebec, they came from New Brunswick. There's a, a, a town in New Brunswick called Woodstock that has a large black population and is real close to Halton. And you find that people from Woodstock all of a sudden will show up in Halton and get married or have a baby and leave. Or sometimes they would even move farther down into Bangor. And it, it, it was quite interesting to see that, that type of movement. But what's there now? I don't know, everybody I know except one person has left. <laughs> so, so I'm not really sure what's, what's they, they don't have, they don't have the community that they used to have. Now, I, I don't, I don't want to say that's because there are fewer blacks there, because I don't know, but it would seem like it. Yeah. Yes. The Abyssinian just got, if I read correctly, just got a, a huge donation that's going to allow them to finish. Uh, I forget what it was or how much. I'm going to have to find that out. It's been a while. Uh, I have a lot of connections to the Abyssinian. And again, these are things I did not know until I started looking at my family and other things. Uh, my five-time grandfather was Christopher Christian Manuel. You heard me talk about the rubies. Christo Christopher Christian Manuel's wife was Sophia Ruby. So that's my line too. And that's the group that came out of New Gloucester that I had made mention about. Uh, but in 1828, Christopher Christian Emanuel and Reuben Ruby, uh, brothers, brother-in-laws, and four other black men uh, created an organization, got approval from the state, and built the Abyssinian church. Interestingly, because the, the black people pulled out of the congregational church, the first church. The Abyssinian was actually a congregational church, and it was called the Abyssinian, or you would see it in some places as the fourth congregational church. So they stayed in the same thing. Uh, it was started to be built in 1828. It was built by uh, local blacks. Uh, a lot of blacks were carpenters on, on shipyards. And the, the church was built like a ship upside down. <laughs> Very interesting. When they, in the, re, in the, doing the reconstruction of it, they took all the walls out, uh, you know, and could see the way the, the boards were printed, uh, were put in. They were like A to A. <laughs> and apparently it was, built on the ground and then lifted up, not the whole building, but sections. And that's the way it was built, just like you would a ship, except this would be up, the, the keel would be the roof. <laughs> uh, and in 1912, the, there were, I think, seven members of the church or seven or maybe 12 members, but there was a, a five person or seven person committee 
uh, that ended up selling the church. My grandfather was one of those. He wanted to give the money to a church, another black church in Portland called the AME Zion Mission and was, was voted out. I mean, they, they voted that down. The money went to the congregational church, the, the diocese or whatever they, they call, and they actually gave money to the AME Zion Mission until it ran out. The AME Zion Mission in 1943 was renamed the Green Memorial AME Zion Church. The one I grew up in, although the green is not me, it's a different family entirely. No more questions? Oh, I've enjoyed being here. I, I hope I've answered your questions. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I did.